Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you out this morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, how many of you watch newscasts? There's the news. Okay, they don't do as much now because the electronic age has everything like immediate. I think if you watch most of them, they'll have a tablet there in front of them. So late breaking news is, is right there in front of them. Well, in the day, uh, some time ago, they'd be given news newscast and you might see them touch your ear and say, oh, oh wait a minute, this is just coming in. They were feeding them information to, to pass out to the, to the group. And it was a change from what the regular for, uh, newscast was. Well, I think there's, there's some information coming in. This is a little different than the original newscast. So we'll see what, what God is doing and how he's working out. It's not, it's not entirely different, but it's, you know, while the songs are going on, things, things are changing. We're in Mark, though. We'll still be in Mark. Uh, Mark, this is a participation question. Mark is presenting Christ as the what? Servant. Servant. Servant of God. And we've come to the high point. Uh, we've uh, seen how Christ was identified by baptism, just as we did today, identified by baptism with the servants of God. He faced trials. By committing to God, he faced trials. And he committed to a message. The message was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was. God was with us. Uh, God was dwelling with us in, in, the, in, the, in the message, in the, in the book, in the gospel. And then he called disciples. He trained them on the job. And he taught them, he showed them, this is what a servant is. And he worked as a servant, uh, showing them what a servant does. Uh, we talked about how he, he did miracles, he taught, that all those things were to, to show forth the kingdom of God. And uh, the, the message, the miracles, everything was, was around that one theme, and that is the kingdom of heaven was, was there, was at hand. And he fed, he fed 5,000, he fed 4,000, and it was important to the disciples to understand that they had a hard time understanding. Um, he uh, was teaching them that they could trust God's sufficiency, and then he uh, was in discussion with the Pharisees and the scribes. They'd come and say, hey, what's all this stuff going on? And he, he stuck with Scripture, not with the traditions of the fathers, which caused uh, schism, caused the uh, fighting between the, the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, the religious leaders in Christ. And then uh, we are called to follow the example of Christ. And as it, as it finished up last week, we hit the high point, and Peter made the declaration uh, after Jesus had healed a blind man, and we see this repeating, uh, Christ was announced, he started attacking the kingdom of Satan by casting out demons, he taught and he preached, and, then, and he, he uh, had, did miracles, then he healed a blind man. And Peter went out, and uh, or the disciples went out with Jesus, and in verse 27 of chapter 8, so we're changing just a little bit, so Mark 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 27, and we'll read a little bit and, and talk a little bit, kind of introing into the, into the message. And Jesus went out and his disciples to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, as you're walking along, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And Jesus said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, Thou art the Christ. And this is monumental. They, uh, through the, the work of the Spirit, as we see in the other Gospels, they realize that this is the Messiah. This is God with us. And in their minds, maybe, they're going to Daniel. We, we went back there last week, and we'll, I guess, go there again. It's a good thing to see, good thing to remind ourselves of. In uh, Daniel, and maybe chapter 5, No, no, not This is what happens when you switch Bibles. It looks different. Yeah. 
If people are there looking, look where it says the, the uh, Son of Man is from going to. Seven. Oh, are you putting it up there? Okay, yes, the Ancient of Days. There we go. Thank you. Uh, skip that. Okay. So thank you for your patience there. Daniel chapter 7, and I'll start with verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up and sprang one of them, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of man, and mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was like fiery flame, and his, and his wheels as burning fire. The fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which, were, which the horn spake, and I, and I beheld until the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As I considered the rest of the beasts, they had their dominions taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came from the clouds. And this is potentially who they were considering because the Jews expected God to come and reign and they expected Him to lay down justice and, and so this would be this, uh, the Son of Man coming. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given unto Him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people nations and languages should serve him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So when Christ, or when uh, Peter says that this is the Christ, they are getting visions of Christ coming, of God coming and setting up his kingdom on earth. And so then Jesus goes on and says, you know, one kind of amazing thing, and that is, he charged them that they should tell nobody. And then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. So he was going to be opposed. There's going to be uh, many things brought against him. He's going to be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, uh, be rejected of the chief priests and scribes and the elders, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake these things openly, openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Because this wasn't. Fitting Peter's doctrine. If the Messiah comes, according to Peter, he needs to set up his kingdom and start reigning. But Peter didn't know everything. So Christ, after Peter said, you are the Christ, uh, he, uh, Christ says, I'm going to die, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he turned about and looked on the disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. So he could see in Peter's heart that he had in mind this earthly kingdom, and that's not what Christ had come yet to establish. And so we'll, I'll stop, I'll pause reading there, and let's, let's open with prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel that you've given us, uh, the message of Christ. Help us to share it freely with those we come in contact with. Help us, help us to share it wisely and truthfully to, to everyone. We thank you that you have not left us to have to fend for ourselves, but you've given us of your spirit. You've given us your word. Father, we can read your word daily. Your spirit will nourish us in it. Um, every day is not, a, is not a feast. Sometimes sometimes we eat and we seem to get nothing from it, Father. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's more than we can comprehend or, or we don't know... To what, what to think. Father, help us not to be discouraged, but continue to read. Uh, if it's not there in our hearts, Father, we won't use it. We ask that you to let again bless your word, bless the, the ears of the hearers, the lives of the hearers here today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So Peter 
makes the announcement that Jesus is the Christ, and Christ agrees with him, that is true. But then as it goes on to say that I, I'm going to be rejected of the, the leaders, of the religious leaders, I'm going to be crucified, Peter, uh, though it doesn't fit his, his idea of who the Messiah was going to be. And so as he starts to rebuke Christ for making these statements, Christ begins to rebuke him. And we're going to skip down to, to chapter 9. It's not that far in your, in your Bibles. But I'll give uh, uh, Paul, it looks like, around the time there. In chapter 9 of Mark, we'll start with verse 2. Uh, chapter 9, verse 2, and we'll continue through uh, verse 13. And after six days, Jesus takes with him Peter and James and John, and leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto him Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he was not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only, with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they came until the Son of Man risen from the dead. So we've heard a whole bunch of keep this to yourself. But he gives them a time frame, until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another with the rise, what the rising from the dead should mean, even though Christ had clearly told them earlier that he's going to be crucified and raised again. And they said, they asked him, saying, why say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily comes first and restores all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said at naught. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed or pleased, as it is written of him. And other gospels mention that the disciples realize he's talking about John. So this this is a, the turning point in the book of Mark. Christ has been instructing the disciples. They've seen many miracles happen. They have uh, heard Jesus teach many things. And because all these things have happened, they have recognized that this is, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And, the, and then they're confused because Christ immediately tells them that you know, right, right after they say, you're the Christ, he says, I'm going to have to suffer, suffer many things. And it's, it's really key, I think, how he says that. And we're going to back up a little bit um, to chapter 8 again in verse 31. And he says, he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Before this point in the Gospel of Mark, and this is like the midpoint in, in words even, before this chapter, Christ had referred to himself as the Son of Man, or others had referred to him as the Son of Man only a few times. If I will guess, this will keep you involved here. How many times? I wouldn't have known this, so just take a guess. How many say one? How many say two? Okay, two. How many say three? Three. Okay. How many four? Okay, there's two times. Two times. Up until this point, Christ had said he was the Son of Man, I think once, and then someone had said about him, I think it was one of the demons said, oh, you Son of Man. So two times up until this point. Now, after this point, from this point on, where he's revealed as the Son of, or as he's called the Christ, here's another guess for you. How many times does he use of himself, Son of Man? How many say 10? Okay, how many say 11? I'm going to say 12. Okay, good. good. Good choice. 12 times he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Something has changed. This is a change in his ministry. 
up until this point, he has been focusing, I think, on training his disciples. And the training doesn't stop. It's not like, okay, disciples, I'm going to train you. Now, I am the, you know that I'm the Christ. I'm the Son of Man. I am, I am Messiah. I'm Emmanuel. And I'm going to stop training now and go do this, this other task that the Father's called me to do. But he has focused on training them up until this point when he's revealed as the Son of God. And now he has another job along with that that he has to do. And that's to complete everything that the Father has called him to do. And so there is a, there's a little change in the flavor of Mark. He, he refers to himself not more often. He refers, refers to himself as the Son of Man. So he is starting to reveal himself as God with them. And so uh, the tenor of the book is changing. He, he identified himself with the believers when John the Baptist baptized him. Now he's identified himself to the, to the select disciples as God. And he's God with us. And he, he has a mission now to pay for the restoration of, of, of fallen man. Uh, he's going to be crucified. And that, that is all maybe introduction into what the message for today was going to be. And that is that you, as a, a child of God, as a servant of God, are going to have to face opposition. And in Christ's opposition, the servant that the servant of the Lord, Christ, gives away his life. And that is what we as servants of him are called to do, is to give up our lives. Christ, we know, is saying here that he has to give up his life physically. He is going to be crucified. And he tells them that in Mark chapter 8, verse 31 and following. He tells them that in Mark chapter 9, verse 30 and following. And he tells them that again in Mark chapter 10, verse uh, something around 30 and following. So three different times he's telling them the Son of Man has to die. And we, we have to die as well. I mean, not, we're all going to die physically, every single one of you. Unless Christ comes, you're going to die. But uh, as, as much language and, and real realistic violence as there is in Band of Brothers, there, there is a good statement, and I've used it here because it is a good statement. There was a lieutenant who ends up being the captain by the time that the war's over, but he, he seemingly had no fear. And as they got newer soldiers in, they, they were scared. And, and one of the guys had just hunkered down in the foxhole while the whole battle went on and couldn't move. And this lieutenant comes by and asks him how he's doing. And I'm not remembering this 100%, so you know, take it with a grain of salt if you've seen it. But the guy says, how? How, do you, how are you so bold? How are you so brave? And he, he told the guy, well, the problem for you is you're still alive. And you have hopes of getting out of here alive, so you're trying to protect yourself. If you just understand that you're already dead and you're not getting out of here, it makes it a lot easier. And that's why the lieutenant, and he made it out of the war, that's why he could be fearless, is because in his mind, I am already dead. And there is no more fear. In the service of Christ, reckon yourselves already dead in him. And then there is no fear, because we, uh, we have nothing to lose. Everything is in him, and we have nothing more. And the servant of the Lord has to give himself away. Another thing the servant of the Lord has to do is in Mark chapter 9, and at verse, at Mark chapter 9 starting at verse 33. I like the disciples. They're keeping it real. They have announced that Jesus is the Christ, and they fully believe that, and then and Peter, you know, Peter said it, and he gets, he gets called uh, Satan later. Uh, he sees Christ transfigured, and he still doesn't quite understand it. But Christ says, I'm going to have to die, and there, there's turmoil about that. So now in chapter 9, verse 33, he says, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them another question. Why is it that you disputed among yourselves along the way? But they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves, who would be the greatest? And Jesus sat down, knowing their hearts, and he called the twelve to him and said, if any man desire to be first, 
the same should be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever shall receive one such child in my name receives me. And whosoever shall receive me receives him who sent me. A child was amongst the lowest in the society. I mean, children were the heritage from the Lord. They loved them. That's not an issue. But the children started out as servants, raised by servants. And then when they reached adulthood, 12 or 13, they, they were brought into the, the family even more. And by age 30, they had taken over stuff. But children were humble. They, they were, uh, you know, again, loved, but they, they were almost a separate culture among themselves. And Christ is saying, the one who serves, the one who is the servant, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It, it, it requires humility. And another lesson he gave them is in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse uh, 35. And uh, it says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou should do for us whatever we ask of you. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. That's always dangerous if somebody comes and says, Hey, can you do me a favor? We probably want to know what the favor is first before we start to do it. And he says unto them, What would you like that I should do for you? And they said to him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on their right hand, and the other on their left hand in thy glory. So they still haven't gotten it yet. Christ says, I'm going to die. That's what I've come here for to do. And they're still seeing this Son of Man kingdom that he said, not now, but they're, they're, they're hard-headed. And it's encouraging to us, encouraging to me. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I have to drink of and be baptized with the baptism I have to be baptized with? And they, in their naivety, said to him, we can and Jesus said to them, to them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism I baptize with, shall you be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on the left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to him for them for whom it is prepared. And then the ten heard it, and they were uh, displeased with James and John. So again, keeping it real, hey, what, you know, where are they trying to get special privileges? What about us? We've been here just as much as they have. Man, they're just trying to get in there. And, you know, they're from Galilee just like he is. And they're, they're the special ones. You know, they, don't, they don't listen to Matthew, the tax collector. Nobody likes him. And so there's grumbling and complaining going on amongst the twelve disciples. And Jesus calls them to him and says, You know that they which, have, which are accounted to be... Let me start over. Sorry. You know that they, which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. So he's saying, you know how the worldly structure is. There's some Gentiles here, and they have somebody ruling them. And those rulers have somebody ruling them. And there's a hierarchy of rulership, leadership, over top of them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you shall be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So we come back to this. The servant of the Lord must be willing to give up his life. He must, he must count his life as nothing. It's, you know, the scripture says, He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy to be counted with me. Uh, Matthew uh, two times it says, "Whoever loses his life for my sake uh, and the gospel shall find it." And and twice he told his, the disciples, "It's not a matter of greatness; it's a matter of humility." So the servant of the Lord has to be humble. And then the last thing that he he's going to say that the servant of the Lord does, the servant of the Lord needs to do, and that is to protect the servants of the Lord, to protect the flock. In chapter nine. Verse 42, still in Mark. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. He's, he's given a picture of a tough life. He's saying, you, you servants of me, of Christ, you servants, you have to give up your life. You servants, it's not about you anymore. It's about being a servant. It's about humility. 
So who? Who is, who is standing for us? Who is protecting us? If, if we are to give up our lives, if we're to be humble. And he, and he says in Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he was cast into the sea. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. He has some children with him, but he's referring to us. Whoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck if he was cast into the sea. I learned how to survive in water um, with my cousins. We had a swimming pool, they had a swimming pool, and we'd play keep away. It's, it's like on the playground where you have a ball and try to throw it back and forth and keep somebody from getting it. And you'd bounce it and you'd throw it and sling it around and do all kinds of deception. Well, we'd do that in the swimming pool. And there's another tool in the swimming pool that gets you to give up the ball. That's for somebody 10 years older than you to put their hand on your head and push you under the water and keep you there. And you can only breathe water for about two balls. And after that, you have to come back to the surface. So I've, I've come close to drowning. I know how it feels like to get water in your lungs. And there's some panic going on about that time. And Christ is saying, if someone should offend even the least of these my children, it would be better for them to drown. It would be better for them to be thrown unrecoverably into the water than that they would have offended one of these least ones of mine. When we serve the Lord, he says, to be a servant of the Lord, you have to give up your life. For all of us is to give up our claims to ourselves as our own. And, and for some, it may actually be for us to give up our lives. Um, David mentioned the movie about Saul, about Paul. We do not know what they, the early church went through. We can see the movie and we get an idea. We can read what they went through and get an idea, but we do not know. And we have struggles in our minds. You know, why does God allow this? God, God could protect everybody, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, that's a pretty amazing story. I would like to be one of those guys. Hey, do you know what happened to me? They threw me in a furnace. I was all tied up, and as soon as I got to the bottom, there was no ropes. My clothes didn't burn off. My hat didn't burn off. And they come and took me out. That would be a pretty neat thing to be able to say. But that doesn't happen very often. That's the miraculous. That's, that's the, the stories that make the Bible because they're outside the ordinary. If you look at Hebrews, it throws everybody else into just a few sentences and says many more were cast to the lions. They had their young removed from them. They, they died by the sword. They died by the beasts. Uh, they were burned. You know, there's a, a multitude of Christians who have, have died for their faith in Christ. And there will be a multitude more die for their commitment as a servant of Christ. And I'd like to say, I'd like to be able to tell you, you know what, if you give your life to Christ, everything will be great. You'll face no opposition. Uh, your barns will be full, your wall will be full, your car will never have a flat tire. Life will just be perfect. But I unfortunately have to tell you, if you commit your life to Christ, your life's going to be tough. And you wonder, and you will wonder sometimes, God, why do you allow these things to happen? And why do you, you let... These sufferings come on the, not, not just the, the natural worldly sufferings of aging or you know, broken arms and legs and that sort of stuff, but, but maybe persecution, uh, having, your, having things taken from you only because of your faith in Christ. And you wonder, you know, why? Why are you letting these things happen? And Christ, Christ said, hey, you're my disciples. They persecuted me. Guess what? They're going to persecute you. 
The here is how the apple of his eye is considered. Whoever defends one of these, least of mine, it would have been better if they were never born. That's how much he loves you. You cannot imagine the horror reserved for those who persecute the church of Christ. And God is protecting you. Uh, if you look in Job, Satan, or Satan comes up into heaven and God says, Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, Well, yeah, but you have a hedge about him. And God let that hedge go down so that Satan could attack him. Um, in Psalms, and, and Satan quotes this when he's trying to tempt Jesus. Uh, David says, He has given his angels charge concerning me. He is protecting me with his angels. And, and Satan brings it up and, and to Christ and says, well, hey, you know, if the scripture's right, he, he will give his angels charge concerning you. And he, they will hold you up if you should ever dash your foot against a stone. And, and Christ knew that he was going to suffer. But he said, you know, get behind me, Satan. These are not, you're, you're misusing the word of God. And then one more one more reading in Matt, Mark chapter 10. And starting with verse 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And this shows you the kind of the, you know, children are okay, but there's an adult world and there's a children's world. And, and you need to keep the children away from the master because he's busy. And then it helps us understand the humility. We are servants even for the least of these, even to the children. And they brought the children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was very displeased and said unto them, Suffer or allow the little children to come to me and forbid them not. For all such is the kingdom of heaven. We are, we are his children. We, we accept him with childlike faith. Verily, truly, I say unto you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up, and he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And the servant of the Lord has given himself up Giving his life up so it's not his own anymore. It's not her own anymore. The plans that we have only are the plans that he has for us. There's no ambition for earthly wealth, earthly acclaim. Just a humble servant of the Lord. And we wonder, here on earth especially, you know, well, who's standing up for me? Christ is looking forward to the day, and he, he does it in our hearts even now. He's looking forward to the day when he can take you up in his arms. Just as he took those children up in, in his arms, and, and he can hold you in heaven with all of the cares of the world passed away. Today, we got a job to do. We're his servants. We give our lives up to his service. We are humble. We will serve the lowliest of the low. And we are protected, maybe not the way that we would like to be, but the way that God has called us to be protected while we serve Him here. And we, we are more blessed, maybe, than many. We think we are. We, we do not really face persecution. I hope we don't have to. That is not something I, I wake up in the morning and say, God, our Father, would you, would you please send persecution our way? I think we need it. And we may. The church grows. You know where the church is growing most right now? China. The church is persecuted in China and is growing. So the church grows in persecution, but I, I don't wish that on me. I don't wish it on my children. But if persecution should come, remember that there is a loving Father just who is as much as you can understand it now, holding you in his arms, 
You wait for that day, he will hold you there forever. So we come up and have our invitation. Everybody, please stand. Turn to page number 320. Page 320. If you have not given yourself up to the Lord, either by not being saved or by not committing yourself fully to Him, this is a day that you can do that. Thank you.